Now, I know the Gumbara from Yonkers, who used to telephone this radio station with uh, propitious regularity, uh, no longer calls. But he would feel, if he knew, well, the, he used to say, hey, Bob, why don't you get a Westchester County line? We get a Westchester line, he's good. But he would feel bad to know that it wasn't being used. It's 237 WMCA. 237. And this time it's Howard Squadron, Mr. Squadron, the former president, American Jewish uh, Congress. I'm still the president of the American well, Jewish. Well, why did they put down former on here? I didn't. I was for you. I talked to George Ball. I know you're familiar with Mr. Ball and. Uh, and with his views. And with his views. I asked him if he had a question I would like to put to you. And uh, at first he said no, but then he uh, thought about it and he said. He would like me to ask you this question, and I'll defer to the ambassador and ask his question first. Uh, ask Mr. Squadron, who's going to pay for all the destruction? Uh, should we deduct, uh, if we pay, uh, from aid to Israel? Uh, that is uh, pretty much a fair uh, transcription of what he uh, asked. Well, I think that he does not understand the Lebanese, or he would not ask that question. I have been to Lebanon within the last month. I have visited Tyre and Sidon and Beirut, and I have been to Nabatia and Ale and Babda. I've been to Jezin, and I have seen the way the Lebanese people, who are probably the most remarkable survivors in the world, how they have coped with this situation and how they have coped with what's gone on there during the last 10 years, since the PLO first came in, through the Civil War, through the Syrian arrival, uh, where more than 100,000 Lebanese were killed before any of this Israeli action started. The Lebanese are very good about restoring their own country, conducting their own commercial enterprises, surviving in the midst of the most incredible conditions, and they will do it all by themselves. Mr. Paul is probably not aware that the Lebanese banking system has continued to operate with foreign money in the banks all through this period, nobody has lost a dollar. In spite of the fact that there was no central government authority, nobody to regulate them, because that is the way the Lebanese people are. So there will be no cost to the United States and nothing to deduct. But I do think that one ought to understand where Mr. Ball is coming from when he asks those questions. He is really trying to say, why aren't we charging the Israelis, either in a military way or in an economic way, with the consequences of their acts? If Mr. Ball were saying that only about Lebanon, I would like to answer it directly, and I will as far as Lebanon is concerned. But I must tell you that Mr. Ball appeared at the Council on Foreign Relations, of which both he and I are members, a month before the Lebanese action started, and said exactly the same things about what the United States policy should be towards Israel before any of these events occurred. He has had this view about the United States and Israel for years now. For years now, he has believed that Israel should be punished by the United States, should be sanctioned by the United States, that military help should be uh, restricted, that economic aid should be limited until Israel does, does what he, Mr. Ball, thinks is the proper policy, which is to give back all the territory yet since the 67 war without getting any peace from its neighbors, without getting any assurance as to its own security. Because he is concerned that that is the right thing to do as far as the Palestinians are, are, are concerned. He, is only regard, he only is concerned about that issue and nothing else. Now, you know, that's his view, and he's entitled to have it. And I don't, I don't criticize him for it, but I think we ought to understand that it has nothing to do with the Lebanese situation. I think we ought to understand that his question, which is a loaded question, has absolutely nothing to do with the way the Lebanese will deal with their own problem just as soon as the PLO is out of there, and the Syrians are out of there, and the Israelis are out of there. They'll restore their country. They'll restore their commercial activity. Uh, Mr. Ball did uh, say that uh, Israel was on the verge of an apartheid uh, policy, uh, and um, he says that uh, they are uh, going back on uh, the uh, promise of Camp David. Well, that has been his view for a long time, and again, it has nothing to do with Lebanon. So let us divide it in the t in, into two parts, as you have suggested. With respect to West Beirut, the Israelis have been in Lebanon now for eight weeks. They have given Ambassador Habib every opportunity 
Hi, Ambassador Habib is a very able diplomat, very conscientious, very competent, who has tried his best to get from the PLO and under difficult conditions because he only deals with them indirectly. Some commitment to leave that is not simply in principle but has a tangible reality, and he has not succeeded. The Israelis have lost patience in the last few days. Our president has said he has lost patience as well, of course, with the, with the fact that Israel, he believes, is interfering with the Habib mission. In fact, uh, Habib tried for 10 months to get the Syrians to remove their missiles from Lebanon unsuccessfully. He was on his way even before the Israeli invasion occurred to Lebanon to convince the Syrians to do that, to convince the PLO to get out. None of that can work without the military pressure that the Israelis are bringing to bear. That's an unfortunate fact. But Arafat and the PLO people have no place to go. The rest of the Arab world has quite cynically refused to receive them. And they don't want to go because there is no place else in the Arab world where they will have the freedom of movement, the control of territory that they have had in Lebanon. The central governments of the other countries where they might go are much too strong. So from their point of view, this delay and stalling is understandable. But since it is in the United States' interest for the PLO to be out of Lebanon, since it is the Lebanese government wish for the PLO to be out of Lebanon, and the wish of the Lebanese people, I assure you, I spoke to Shiites and Maronites and Sunnis and Catholics, everybody had the same view. Get the PLO out. They were very unhappy about PLO attitudes when they were in that country. They literally took things over and, and uh, you know, appropriated homes and so on. And people want them out. And it is in the interest of the Israelis and the interest of the ability of the Middle East. But the only way it's going to happen is with the continued military pressure. There are casualties, no doubt, and they are to be regretted. Every casualty is to be regretted, whether it is a military casualty of a soldier or a casualty of a civilian caught in the war. That is one of the tragedies of our having wars. But without that pressure, Arafat will sit there and continue to negotiate from now to the end of time. And the Palestinians. I share Mr. Paul's concern that the Palestinians' problem should be solved. I think it must be solved. But his view that... Uh, the Camp David Agreement has been violated by Israel and that uh, the Begin government is somehow trying to set up uh, apartheid, which is, of course, a loaded word to begin with, full of emotional overtones, is really quite unfair. He forgets to begin with that the autonomy proposal was Begin's proposal. In December of 77, immediately after the visit by Sadat to Jerusalem, Begin came here with a 26-point autonomy plan for the West Bank and Gaza that he had written out in his own hand. Now, it is true that he regarded that at that time as a permanent solution, not a temporary one, and that the Carter administration convinced him that there had to be a five-year interim period under his autonomy plan, and then a discussion after three years of that five years about ultimate sovereignty. But he accepted that. He signed that at Camp David. And there have been negotiations about autonomy since, and unfortunately, because the media doesn't purport in detail what the proposals are, Nobody is aware that the Israeli proposals for autonomy have been quite generous. But even if they were less generous, they're better than the present situation. There's been nobody to accept them. The Egyptians, who are part of the negotiations, there's a three-sided negotiation with the United States being the third side, are utterly unable, and I am now again talking from personal knowledge, personal discussion with uh, President Mubarak, with uh, uh, the Foreign Minister Kamal Hassan Ali, with... Uh, uh, Mr. Raleigh, who is the uh, Foreign Affairs Secretary. I have had personal conversations with them. They've made it very clear that they are not going to do the kinds of things that Dot did, that is, take bold risks for peace. They are going to negotiate only what they understand the Palestinians will accept. And, of course, when you are talking about the Palestinians, you are talking about the most radical elements, because they always control what's acceptable. That means that up until now, what the PLO rejected, the Egyptians would not agree to, and the Israelis would not agree to what the PLO demanded. But now I believe the opportunity is present for the Israelis and the United States, because I think the United States has an enormous role to play. It should review the Israeli proposals. It should conclude that they are reasonable and just and fair as a beginning autonomy, clearly better than the present situation, as I said before. And it should offer those to the West Bank and Gaza, regardless of whether the Egyptians think they can go along. And then, if the people living there accept it, they should put it into effect and begin to move. I have said for years that the dynamics of that autonomy, once in place, is towards 
some arrangement other than Israeli sovereignty, ultimately. It may be a federation with Jordan. It may be Jordanian sovereignty. It may be some kind of confederation where there will be uh, uh, demilitarization of that area and security posts for Israel uh, and so on. But whatever the arrangement is, one has to get moving. The failure to get moving so far is not an Israeli failure. The Israelis have put forth in good faith tangible, concrete proposals for autonomy. There has been nobody to accept them. The point that you're shelling is you make some errors. But I must say to you, Mr. Grant, that there has been an exaggerated set of reports of casualties that have come out of Beirut Radio, which is controlled by the PLO. Uh, and uh, I, for example, was told earlier today of a shelling that hit the American University Hospital and that the 120 people who were in the hospital were injured. That's what I was told. So I checked it, because I happen to have sources uh, in the American University. Yeah. It was simply untrue, totally untrue. There had not been a single casualty. There was some shrapnel that hit the outside of the building and never injured anybody. But we have gotten these exaggerated reports constantly. The American University, uh, for example, issued a report at the beginning of July that in the first five weeks of the fighting, uh, there had been a total of a 1,000 people treated in the hospital. At the very same time, Professor Saeed, who teaches up here at Columbia University, was uh, one of the co-sponsors of an ad that appeared in the New York Times that said there were 40,000 casualties. Now, I don't know what you can do with that. You know, if, if the media will not accept uh, the report of the people who are actually involved or will not go to verify reports from people who obviously have a self-interest in exaggerating them and making themselves look better and the Israelis look worse, there is very little that we can do. And you know as well as I, it's un unlike uh, the uh, radio or the print media, uh, the television media depend on a visual. And a visual of a burned-out building or a child wandering or a child injured for whatever reason is much more interesting at the top of the news, even if it comes from a fire in Brooklyn, let alone if it comes from Lebanon, than a huge story about uh, 5,000 or 10,000 people killed in Hamra by the Syrians because you can't get a picture. You can get anywhere close. Mr. Whether there is a difference of opinion between Israel and the United States about American foreign policy, about what the foreign policy ought to be in the Middle East, uh, is an old question. There never, you know, when the British went and invaded the Falklands, the United States hesitated for a long time as to which side they were going to come down on. And as a matter of fact, I remember Senator Moynihan saying that we were steering an absolute middle course between right and wrong. Uh, it seems to me that these issues will always arise. The Amer American foreign policy is not hostage to an Israel lobby. On the contrary, uh, Israel is much more subject to American pressure and to American interests and concerns uh, than most countries in the world. The British, in effect, told us to go fly a kite when we urged restraint on the Falkland Islands. Margaret Thatcher did what she wanted. We urged restraint on the Israelis, and they waited for eight weeks. They gave Habib a lot of time. And right now, they are very concerned about American uh, reaction. As to the Israel lobby in this country, there are many people in this country who feel that Israel has the right to take the steps it needs to take in its own security and its own interest, and that Israel is such an important strategic asset to the United States and so important to American policy in that part of the world that the United States ought to be more understanding, more sympathetic, and bring less pressure to bear. What is going to happen, you know, as the result of this Lebanese action is that the United States will have more influence in that part of the world, be stronger, there will be a free Lebanon, PLO and the Syrians, both of whom have been Soviet satellites, are going to be uh, decreased in their influence. And all of that at the expense of Israeli soldiers and Israeli lives. And at the same time, interestingly enough, at the expense of Israeli of public opinion concerning Israel because of the way the administration is dealing with it. And that's very unfortunate in my view. Just one thing about your last statement about bail. Uh, one of the strengths, of course, of our democracy and what makes this the greatest country in the world is that uh, we're supposedly innocent and have to be proven guilty. At what point would you or anybody decide that a person is guilty and denies all bail? At what point would you do that? Well, I 
think the point that you would do that is uh, if the nature of the crime were of a uh, uh, a violent nature, if the person charged with the crime had uh, a uh, a record which indicated that he was uh, prone to violence, uh, that a judge could determine at that point whether this was a a one-time shot or whether this person had a long record which uh, would lead any normal logical mind to conclude that uh, in all likelihood he did commit the crime and even though he wasn't convicted uh, in a court of law yet right. uh, the, uh, uh, the the overwhelming evidence was that more than likely he did it and better that you protect society uh, than uh, to uh, play this lofty uh, game that uh, you would have us play and uh, let him go uh, let him get out on bail um, I, I still despise guns, but I also recognize the fact that there is logic to what you say. I also realize that there are store owners in every borough in the city of New York, for example, who from time to time have had to use their guns, and in some cases have used them quite well, and they have given us the only death sentence we have in the city of New York, or the only capital punishment we have. You see, when I pick up the paper, when I see on the front page of the Post the news, of course, the Times have reports that type of crime. It's beneath them. It's not all the news that's fit to print. Anyway, getting back, when I see the body of uh, uh, Joe Doe on the ground as uh, uh, county uh, morgue employees carted it off, I say, hey, that's great because this guy won't hurt anybody anymore. And then you read about who that guy was. He's identified. You read that the guy's got a record as long as both your arms put together. That he's been ripping people off. That he's been right. wanted for this and wanted for that. And, uh, you know, it's it's sad but true that it's the only way we're going to get justice is in that regard. But in saying what I've just said, somebody could point a finger at me and accuse me of what the civil libertarians consider the worst crime of all. <laughs> and that's vigilanteism. Well, thank you, Eddie. Magazine on special edition. Get Gaddafi. Dexterity. The verdict was an outrage. The verdict was an insult to uh, the history of uh, American justice. And uh, the uh, woman who stood alone against these uh, bigoted, biased fellow jury members is brave far beyond, far beyond my own efforts at bravery. I salute her. I hope that she or some member of her family is listening so that she can know that her bravery, her single-handed efforts to bring some sanity into an insane trial in an insane city, in an insane country, has not gone totally unnoticed and unappreciated. I thank you. And, of course, this uh, verdict came in while I was out of town. I, w yeah, I, I was lucky I wasn't in town. Because had I been in town, I, uh, if, I, I probably couldn't have been able to, to, to accept this, this lunacy that the American people seem to uh, nonchalantly accept. My heart breaks for yeah. Vera Scarangella, the wife. Uh, my heart breaks for every New York City policeman, every policeman everywhere who has got to be totally demoralized by this most obscene verdict. Yeah. Uh, as you say, how could these guys who were found guilty of attempting to murder, I believe it was Officer Scanlon, how could they, how could they be acquitted of murdering Scarangella? That would mean that there were two sets of, uh, of uh, people shooting. Yeah. Uh, uh, another duo shot and murdered Scarangella and then left the scene and these guys came in and shot his partner. Only his partner survived. It's, gonna make, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I find it, of course it's unbelievable. I find it di very difficult, Mike, to believe that all 11 who voted that way, who wanted it that way, were intimidated. I, I'm sorry, but I think it, it was strictly a case of, of prejudice. I can't, I can't come up with any other answer, and I would be uh, a very insincere person, indeed, if I were to tell you that I thought it was something other than plain old 
Racism. And I'm not, not going to say racism in reverse. I'm tired of putting on the term in reverse. Racism. I mean, you know, Romulo Ayamundi calls. Not even Rami Ayamundi. I mean, forget about Ogumbada from Yonkers. He's retired, but Ayamundi claims he's still with it. Ayamundi. Ram, Rami Ayamundi. Romulo. Maybe he went out and had his name changed. I don't know. I think we have time to squeeze in one final call for the week. Hello. Hello, Bob. I'd like to have a public apology because this is Romulo from the Bronx and is welcoming you back. I hope the hell you had a tremendous vacation. And what would you think of my President Reagan showing all that leadership when he took that tax bill, went out to the public, got a hold of the congressmen, sat them down, nice eyeball confrontation, spoke to them. They certainly understood and they certainly voted. But you start to work me over pretty good, but here I am, hanging on for a half hour, talking to you. Couldn't be raising anything. It's very minimal, sir. Uh, Rom, <laughs> let me say this. Did, didn't that frighten you when I mentioned your name? Ah, frighten me. Hey, Bob. No, I mean, the doesn't that... The only way I get frightened is when a guy hits me on the head from behind and I can't see him. Hey, wait a minute. But what wasn't... think of Reagan, Oof, buddy. Bob, I'm not... Really. Wasn't that spooky the way I mentioned your yeah. name? Isn't that amazing? That is absolutely... You have vibes, well... Vibes, right. You have those vibes, buddy. You... See, I had the vibes. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you. Go ahead, buddy. You are the soul of the earth. You're the backbone <laughs> of, of the Bronx. Without without you out there, it's all over, Rami. It's all over. Hey, but my boy Reagan showed the muscle, that big smile, 71 years of age, put the pressure on. They all collapsed. Tip O'Neill was up there kissing him, begging him, hugging him. The guy did. He's a leader. What a leader. You'd call it what you will, but what a leader. You know. Thanks for the day. For those of you that didn't make it in, let's hope we can talk on Monday. Until then, your influence counts. You said get... Johnny Calandra's name. Uh, the other guy, I'm not going to mention the man. He's Joe? a very famous guy. Very famous guy. Very I sp- work in politics myself. All right, let's see. Who goes to my house? Wait a minute, let's see. Eddie Koch. Who? No. Eddie Koch? Next governor of New York. No. I'm a Republican. Next governor of New York. The next governor of New York? Yes. Has gone to my house. You know, I'm not talking about Eddie Koch, but he's the next governor of New York. Go on. Lou Lerman? Lou Lerman, he's dead. He's dead. He's out the window. I'm voting against him. Paul Curran? Paul Curran, he's twice as dead. When you said the next governor of New York, Mario Cuomo. He's an Italian. He's dead. Anybody who's an Italian is dead. Well, wait a minute. Those are dead. Hold it, Paul. I spent. I spent. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Slow down. Yes. You keep saying the next governor of New York, right? Is Ed Koch. Now, you said a guy who goes to my house... I didn't mention his name. I'm not you're not going to mention his name, but he's the next governor of New I York. I never said that. Don't give me that. I'm an educated man. Oh, I know I, you're educated. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, Paul, you've got an advantage on me. You obviously are far more intelligent than I ever hoped to be, Paul. I am more intelligent. You came from Chicago. I <laughs> 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 mean, all you worry about is a handful of Paul, guys in Bensonhurst. Wait a minute, Paul. Hold on. Hey, Paul, wait a minute. Wait. How's your love life? Hey, my love life, I have a large family. Seven beautiful, wonderful children. Uh, we don't promote you, pornography. Well, I don't want and you to promote... To pro- hey, Paul, I don't want you to promote... school. Paul, oh, wait a minute, hold it. I don't want you to promote 
anything. But you what? are, sir. You are a disgrace to your Italian heritage. I knew it. You know? I knew that line was going to come out. I'm going to speak it right in here and hit you with a hatchet with it. A hatchet? My brother-in-law is Italian. He hates your guts. <laughs> he said you're a disgrace to the Italians. And they talk about you in Bensonhurst. <laughs> Talk about you in the North Bronx. What are these? You are anathema in Westchester County. Out. Out. No wonder I don't get calls from Westchester County. You know, I called Paul for said I'm anathema. One hour, sir. What's I'm the only guy that's called all day to you. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're calling from Westchester. You're tying up the Westchester line. There's nobody else on the line. I've been calling all day. Yeah. It's all here. Yeah, Paul. Tell you, we tried to be nice to you. Who tried to be nice to me? We. We. My type of people. Your kind of people. I don't people. like you insulting the Irish, number one. And I'm not Who Irish. Who said I insulted the Irish? Every time an Irish lady or a man gets a lady get on it today, you come out right away with the Bobby Sands thing. Now, wait a minute. Wait, Irish, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. She brought up Bobby Sands. I didn't bring up Bo Bobby Sands. a Bonanima. I don't talk about a Bonanima. He's a Bonanima. Uh, once I heard you say in the air, because some Irish kid beat you up in Chicago. No Irish kid ever beat me the up. Irish. And I'm not what Irish. All this, what is this Chicago stuff? Do you know it's been 1959 since I left Chicago? You should go back there. You what know what George Maxey said? About, you see what the guy said about you in the daily news today in the letter? The guy made fun of you. George Maxey don't like your type. Back to your goal. Well, I'll tell you why George Maxey doesn't like me. George Maxey is Armenian. I know George for 25 years. Oh. I'm in the business like you. I, I know see. George better than you know your mother. Yeah, well, why doesn't George like me? Because he thinks you're one of those gobbledygooks that say nothing. Because I'm a gobbledygook that say nothing. Yes. You one day you say one thing, and the next day you attack the same person you were talking to the day before. We don't know where you're going. I, don't, I listen to you every day when I type. You got my typewriter type. screw up, even. I got your typewriter screw up. Yeah, when I'm typing stories, you screw me up because you say... Hey, listen. Hey, you're wonderful. Then you attack the uh, lady. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Paul. You about Jesus Christ. You attacked her at the end. Wait, wait, what did I say about Jesus Christ? What are you talking about? And the lady made reference. Yeah, she's trying to compare yeah. Bobby Says... Wait and... a minute. You always wait until you... Wait, hey, Paul, hold it. Yeah. Hold it, Paul. Wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. I have to do a commercial. Yes. Okay? Yes. Why don't you stay right there, get back to your typewriter, and in just a moment we'll get back to you, okay? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we will return to Paul from Pleasantville, who is a closet Bob Grant fan, in just a moment. Bill, who's uh, been getting off his chest a lot of uh, agita or something there. Yeah, Paul? Yes, sir. Okay, so you say they talk about me at Bensonhurst? Yep. And, uh... Uh, what are they saying in Benson? Are they saying anything different in Bensonhurst that they're saying in uh, Pelham? You know, we're having a big party this weekend out in New Hyde Park, Long Island. There'll be 250 of us, fellas that grew up in New York City. We're all in our 50s today, and we're sending off a couple of girls who grew up with us. They're sitting up to Texas. And we're going to be talking about you. And, we're, and you're not going to be very favorable. And we all think the way you think. We're all conservative-type thinkers. But we're all going to say, does Bob Grant, I think he's crazy in the head. You, you, really? Maybe that's it. What, what? Yeah, seriously, I think I think you let us down. When you first came out of here in New York, we, you espoused a lot of things that we thought, and, and, and we, we try to follow through, namely conservative, I love America, and so forth. Uh, I love God, and I love country. I still espouse that. No, you don't, sir. You play twins against the middle. You go along with some guy for three minutes, and then you hatch it up to death. And the poor guy goes off the air and never call you back again. You've lost more listeners than any radio personality in the history of the radio business. And I've been in the radio business for 40 years myself. You have lost more people who are your friends. They hate you. And you'll never get them back again. They well, switched to Larry King, your nemesis. <coughs> well, first of all, Larry King's not my nemesis. Yes, no. he is. He thinks different than you do. Well, he thinks different, but that doesn't mean he's my nemesis. Well, though. he's your nemesis. He makes a hundred times more than you do. And that's true. <laughs> you wish you had his show. Well, I wish I had his income. Uh, but I don't like those hours. I can't. I tried those hours. Hey, you look, know. if they gave you that money, you'd be there tomorrow morning. I don't know, Paul. I don't know. You know, I tried those hours. I really despise those hours. I can't. At about 11 o'clock, you see, I'm a farmer yule. At about 11 o'clock, I, uh, I start falling asleep. Paul, you don't know me, the real me, the real me. You know what the I mean? The part of his audience is they're only schoolboys mm -hmm. from out of town, you know. You've got a more select, uh, educated audience. Well, uh, listen. Italians, up. Irish, and Jews in New York. But he's got these guys that are working in a hospital in San Antonio, and they say, Hey, Larry, I'm watching the switchboard, Larry. Can you tell me, Larry, if that's the right movie to follow? You ever hear them? No, I don't. I tell you the truth, I, I don't. Ask them, like, better go to the photography movies. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on, first of all, first of all, Paul. I, I don't want you to give me this bum rap about being a photography guy. Yeah, I took that. You have a bum rap, and oh, you don't have to geez. clear your name. 
How do I, how do I, how do I clear my name? I think you're going to have to apologize to a lot of people on the air, saying, I didn't mean to take these 50 women to a movie. No, no, they weren't 50, they were about 225. Well, that's more, that's four times more whores than we thought. Screwballs, what screwball would go to a movie? Hey, but there was a nice old Italian lady with, on crutches that came, and, and I asked her on the air, I said, why did you, she says, look, uh, who wants to have anything to do with me? She says, I, I, I don't have any, any, any excitement in my life. This give me a little bit of excitement. I mean, was that so bad? Made the woman happy for a, for a couple hours? I'll forgive you. You know, what the heck, Paul, I'm not such a bad guy. You give me a bum rap. Even Johnny Calandra told you I was a nice guy. Johnny Calandra, come to put a cigar in his mouth, will you? Keep, take the marbles out of his mouth. Come to Mosthenes, ought to teach him how to speak the English language. I, I took Italian with him in high school. He still can't speak the Italian. Forget the English. <laughs> he has marbles in his mouth. How, how, do, how do you rate? Yeah, okay, Paul, listen. Call again, will you, Paul? I will, sir. Thank you. And God, goodbye, God bless you. Paul, make a novena for me, will you? I'm going to say more than prayers for you. Okay, thanks, Paul. Thank you, sir. Okay. That's Paul of Pleasantville laying it on the line, telling it like it is. I mean, I don't agree with him, but so what he told... At least he told it like like he, he was he was straight out. Saverin is straight... Did you happen to see last night... That pretender, that posturer, that supreme fake. Did you happen to see last night in, in all probability in your bedroom, not in your living room because the hour was late, that Uriah Heap of the 20th century? Did you happen to see that grizzled lover of children whose only concern are the waifs of the Middle East? Did you happen to see the not convincing performance of a man who senses that in defeat he will emerge victorious? Did you happen to see the leer, the self-satisfied grin the quelling, if you will, Yasser Arafat, as he was interviewed by an almost at times obsequious Peter Jennings. I did. And he didn't fool me for one minute. Had he not overplayed his hand, he might have been more effective to the naive across this great land who must have watched Yasser Arafat on ABC Nightline last night. Uh, Mr. Jennings, who came to the sh who came here from Canada because we didn't have enough qualified American native-born American reporters, apparently, uh, came here from Canada got the interview with Arafat and obviously felt it was somewhat of a coup. And uh, Arafat, when he was asked by Jennings the question about being defeated, and I'm paraphrasing because I do not have the actual quote, Arafat said, oh no, they weren't being defeated. They could have gone on. Uh, they could have, uh, they could have fought the Israelis, who were made to appear powerful because of American arms, but really weren't. And he said they could have if they had chosen to. But because they wanted to save the children, they agreed to the Habib plan and were vacating West Beirut. He looked with feigned sad eyes at Jennings and said, Oh, the children, the children, this is important, the children. We must save the children. A man who I dare say, directly or indirectly, in all, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and I'll say it's indirectly, probably responsible for the mutilation and the death and the burning and the uh, suffering of more little children than any singular person in the Middle East. Suddenly he is concerned with the children, the children, yes.
and it upsets me. It's like wandering, uh, your, you know, doing your dirty laundry in public. And then I hear you comment and criticize uh, uh, Roseanne, Ernie, these other people. Whether they, whether they deserve it or not, it just seems to me that it's, it's as I say, laundering one's uh, dirty wash in public. Well, I don't consider that laundering a dirty wash in public because what I'm telling the public is, is nothing that went, went on behind the scenes, nothing that was a secret between any one of us. It's something that the public can see for themselves and comment on for themselves. And don't forget, the lady asked me, I didn't bring it up, the lady asked me what I thought, and I'll be doggone if I'm going to sit behind this microphone and lie, uh, even if by lying... I may come off looking a little better to uh, people like you. Uh, I appreciate what you're saying. Don't misunderstand. Oh, we don't, I don't expect you to lie either. I mean, uh, I think, that, you know, who, who, that guy from Pleasantville that was on the air yesterday. Yes, Paul. Accused you of, 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 of vacillating from one side to the other and going from one point of view to the other. Uh, and my concern is simply this, that, uh, you know, I don't ever hear you talk about who you do like. And let's face it, I mean, you have not exactly reached uh, network status yourself. WMCA Who have made it to, to a far higher level of achievement than you have And it, it irritates me, I'll be honest with you I had to cut you, not because you were being critical But because you used a profanity there And uh, that's why I had to put the, uh, boop, 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 you know, the uh, Oh, I didn't uh, hear it, I'm sorry Well, Luke. you got a little carried away and You, you, you know, you, you said something that uh, I'm really, sorry. really cannot go out over the air I, I, I don't think it would be in good taste so I had to cut that, but uh, not to censor you. Uh, you're sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I no. the, 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 the part that said half, that was what... Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh. I won't repeat it again. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, but uh, the, the fact remains, you know, that uh, I just... I see this as like a sour grapes in you sometimes. Well, it could be. Uh... And to be frank with you, I wish you'd move uptown to uh, that other well, dial location where they could use you in the morning. Okay. And, and I think you'd do a heck of a job for them in the morning. Oh. Well, look, uh, you can you can criticize me all you want, and I really, I don't think it bothers me. Uh, not your type, certainly. Your type of criticism doesn't bother me at all, because you're you're giving your own subjective reaction to my subjective reactions. You see, the fact of the matter is that I find it difficult to accept quotas in anything but especially in my line of work. I feel that people should have paid their dues. And when you get someone on whose voice is so strident, so nasal, so someone who doesn't believe that she has a microphone hooked onto her blouse, <laughs> you know, obviously, I know, I know. obviously she thinks uh, people aren't going to hear me unless I scream and shout. Uh, when you get someone who smiles with that fatuous, inane smile of hers, and... Uh, really has no journalistic background, uh, nothing to commend her, and she's making three, four, five, five times what you make. It hurts. And the, you have to realize she was just in the right place at the right time and had the right gender. Uh, so it's not a knock on her as an individual so much as it is on, on a system that has gone haywire. And, uh, and I still think that the other guy should have his hair styled by someone who knows what he's doing. Unless his head really is shaped that way. And if it is, then the man, then the man needs a neurosurgeon. Bob, it's quite serious. Because he's got edema of the skull. Is there any truth to the rumor that you have been approached by the people? I don't want to talk about it, I thank you, sir. Okay. I was listening until about six months ago, and I picked up again. I heard a very interesting show that you were doing about six months ago. And you were saying, you, when your ratings were falling, you kept on asking people, what am I doing wrong? I'm waiting, people, please call me up and tell me, what am I doing wrong? And I remember thinking, God, when I had listened to you so long ago, you were so cocky and so obnoxious. And you were so good at it, too. That's, I, and I couldn't believe it. I tell you, this guy, and I'd gone out of state, I, and then I'd listen to you again. Holy cow, what happened to him? Let me ask you, what, how are your ratings been doing the last six months? I see you're still on the air. Well, now they're coming back up. They're coming back up. You know why, quite frankly? Because, why? because I'm being myself. And you know, we, we make fun of the public. We say people aren't smart. But you know something? People are smart in certain ways. They know when a person is being I himself agree. I, or I not. I agree with you 100%. I felt that you were trying to like, you know, court favor with the public, that you weren't really being yourself like you used to be. Well, you see, what happened to me uh, is uh, I tried to change. 
because... But why? 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 Because of, uh, well, quite frankly, I'm not going to start lying now. I've got to stay honest if I'm going to survive. Because of a consultant uh, who uh, said that uh, uh, outspokenness was passe, that people didn't want outspokenness, that they wanted... Uh, a very mild, uh, well, they wanted this type of person. I know, guy who Grant is not, you know, Barry Gray. There are two different people. Right, right. Yeah. Well, Barry's been outspoken, and that's why I think he's been an institution in this industry for years. But anyway, be that as it may, I tried to be something I wasn't, and it doesn't work. You've got to be, what is, what is that song, i got to be me? Well, I've got to be me. So now that I'm being me, I think everything will be all right. Anyway, Bob, I just wanted to wish you... You remember the Americanization of Emily? This is the caponization of uh, Robert. Uh, I used to uh, sound like, well, like you're going to hear in just a moment. But there, an engineer. Remember engineers? Anyway, an engineer we had here once took voice tracks that I had with a guy a conversation with a guy, a real stunkola, and teamed them up with a conversation from a nice little old lady. He put them together, and it sounds like this. Now, remember, this is from years ago. If you're listening, Bruce, this is a tape from years and years ago. And the only reason we're playing it is to show how much I've progressed since then. Why don't you come into the studio with me? You sound like a screaming, hysterical woman. So you ought to cut it out and have more dignity. Why don't you come on down to the studio? Oh, have more dignity. Shame on you. You're a big mouth and you don't know, you can't even fight, I bet. You come down here and I'll knock your nose right down your throat. Do you understand that? I, I could punch you in the nose myself. You little pipsqueak. Go to hell. I don't believe <laughs> I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I, I, you know, if we play that much more, people are going to start talking. And we wouldn't want that, would we? Would we want that? Here, what do you think about what you just heard? You, sir, what do you think? How about that? I'm WMCA, Bob Grant, and hello. And again, I just get some male, if they cannot sucker some male into supporting them for a lifetime for producing those children, no problem. They'll just dip into the pockets of all the working men and women of the uh, society and uh, sail right along. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that we really deserve the deterioration and destruction that is pulling the city down around our heads because people are either so stupid, so thick, or else so afraid that they cannot see or will not speak about uh, what is really destroying the city. It is, the, it is from these children that the, uh, the dropouts, the delinquents, the smashers, the trashers, the felony criminals, the political terrorists, uh, the entire underclass scum that makes living in this city unlivable uh, comes. And until we address the problem of uh, getting these women to uh, make it impossible for them to support themselves, by inflicting these children on us, uh, we will not begin to uh, address the uh, real problems of the decay of the uh, city. Very well put, Frank. Unfortunately, you're very well chosen. In my opinion, extremely accurate appraisal will fall on deaf ears. Deaf not because of any organic malfunction. Deaf because... Cowardice causes deafness, blindness, muteness. Deafness causes a condition known as being stum. Can I address that? Yes. Yeah, the point is, just as you say, no politician would dare to address this. No media figure with the solitary exception of and when, with, and, and I'm glad you said that because when, when some of my colleagues saw what happened to me, they said, see, we were smart and he was dumb. Uh, because the thing is that any such person would be said to be against women, against children, and since it is grossly, disproportionately a matter of uh, the black and Latin minorities said to be a uh, racist, uh, I don't consider myself a racist at all or any kind of elitist. It is simply not fair for any individual or any group 
to disproportionately to produce grossly disproportionate numbers of children and fans can expect other people, decent people of whatever race or ethnic background yes. who plan their fertility, who make a 20 year or more commitment to the emotional, moral and financial support of their children to be mercilessly taxed yes. to support uh, stupid and irresponsible people who think nothing of producing yeah. not just one. You know, you are so right. Uh, Many. I yeah, just the other night, and I don't want to sound like a cliche, but just the other night, I went to get an item in a supermarket, and there was a young lady, attractive, uh, white. I don't know what her accent was, but she did have a very considerable accent. But where she was from is really unimportant, whether she was from Ecuador or whether she was from Chile or whether she was from Colombia is uh, is irrelevant what is relevant is she was vibrant healthy she had a child in the uh, cart and eating munching something in the cart the young lady was buying several items convenience foods which of course as you well know cost more than uh, other products and she paid with food stamps and I turned to two gentlemen in back because I was in a bad mood, upset about many other things. And I said, now, what is she doing with the food stamps? Now, both of these gentlemen, now, here's the point. Both of these gentlemen didn't want to talk about it. They shunned me. They were embarrassed. They were afraid. And you know what's ludicrous, Frank? That woman in front with the food stamps had her hands in their pockets. And yet, they didn't want to know something. It would be like you were walking down the street and somebody mugs you, and you say, I don't want to resist because I don't want to cause trouble. Thank you, Frank. Ah, dear. That's why we are on our way down the chute. We're like someone... Do you remember when you were a youngster, you went to the park or playground or something, and you got on one of those slides? Well, once you let go and started descending, there was no stopping, Right? We've let go. We're descending. Having said all that, Frank, I wouldn't discount anything because we have seen insanity prevail in this country like it's never been before. But let me say this. Probably the best thing that could happen to Giorgiani would be to be uh, to uh, stay out because lugging around 565 pounds, he's more likely to croak staying out than he would be in prison because in prison they take uh, care of him. He wouldn't have to um, walk around or move around. He wouldn't get excited. Well, they said that he'd have 24-hour service, air conditioning, yeah, right. monitoring and all. And besides, the weather would be getting cooler. He wouldn't even need the air conditioning. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, um, it, better that uh, better that he stay, stay out where his chances for croaking would be greater than in jail. I see. Okay, thanks, Pete. I don't think he wants to come back. Well, he wouldn't want to go out a loser either, would he? Ah, he does. He has no ego problems. No. George does not have an ego problem. He's no uh, Billy Martin. He's no George von Steinbrenner. Uh, he's he's a great guy, a class a class man, real class. He deserves better. He really does. Counting on George Forster to do that thing. George Forster is a lousy fielder. Uh, they got him for his bat, and his bat has been. Um, he's over the hill. He's through. He's over the hill. Uh, evidence the fact that a lot of those uh, drives he hits out die on the warning track. That's the difference between George Forster of years before and George Forster this year. Matter of fact, he can't even get his bat around. Notice how many of his of his uh, shots go to right field and right center. Yeah, he, he doesn't also, get around on the ball. He also Maybe, who knows, you know, uh, in a way I suppose I should be glad because I think that the more big money free agent players who... Uh, who flop, the better. And I'll tell you why I say that. Maybe it will discourage even George von Steinbrenner from paying these obscene amounts to guys who play baseball. One more thing. Yes, sir. You opened up the program talking about Jesse Jackson or a statement about Jesse Jackson. Yes, sir. I just wanted to tell you my thoughts about it because every time I have heard him speak, I get the sense that the import of whatever he's saying is to threaten the white community. And I just want to mention that. 
Well, he he runs the uh, city of Chicago. I mean, uh, Jane Byrne may be the mayor, but uh, if you go there, uh, he dominates the news media. Uh, all he has to do is snap his finger, and I mean this literally, and all the television crews are there. He could say, I'm going to take an extra deep breath at 4 o'clock, and they'll cover it. And they'll even have uh, commentators say, notice Mr. Jackson's diaphragm is out one-eighth of one millimeter of an inch more than usual. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, he did take a deeper breath. Specializes a beautiful letter complimenting Paul of Pleasantville. And it was a person who wrote saying Paul of Pleasantville was so right. Do you remember Paul from... Does anybody in the audience... As, I, I'm going to say raise your hand if you remember the call from Paul of Pleasantville. And how do you raise your hand? By actually dialing the number to call. That's the only way I have of knowing. But if you remember, there was a fellow by the name of Paul Pleasantville who really took me to task. And the person who wrote the letter said, instead of laughing, I should have listened very carefully and heeded what he said. Here it is. Okay, it's not a letter, it's a card, so... Dear Bob Grant, I had a chance to listen to you today. Paul from Pleasantville called in. You had a good time with him. It would have been better if you had listened to him instead of laughing. He made a lot of sense. He gave you good advice. He doesn't have your experience in radio broadcasting, but he still came out on top. John Bagdajanian of uh, Freehold, New Jersey. And I uh, just want to say that if Paul of Pleasantville is listening, I wish he'd call and let me know how the weekend turned out. If you remember, ladies and gentlemen, he said, and I quote, about 250 of us guys are going to be at an outdoor barbecue this weekend and we're going to spend the whole weekend talking about you. And I would love to find out if everybody was able to stay awake under such exciting circumstances. Don't I don't understand what? Uh, how I can see homes and buildings that are 50, 60, 70, 100 years old, even more, whether it be in Europe or in this country, and they're magnificent. And yet you see some of these projects, which are only five, ten years old. Right. And they're... What, what do you suppose... What do you suppose causes that? What? People? Is it wind conditions that hit certain buildings and don't hit others? Or is it the people? It... You know what's good? You know, I can trace this all. First you had people moving out of neighborhoods. Right. Then you had people moving out of cities. Now you're having people moving out of one suburb to go to another suburb. Now you're having people go out of one suburb and creating a brand new enclave, a new suburb. Right. The day's going to come. I don't expect to be around to see it because uh, as things uh, go on, I have less and less desire to last that long. But the day's going to come. There'll be an exodus out of the whole country. I don't know. I'm not the like about the answer either, Bob. Well, even, uh, Lee, even those of us who have the answer can't give the answer. Thank you very much, dear. And hello. Hello, Mr. Grant. Yes. This is Dorothy from Montclair. Uh-oh. <laughs> Mr. Grant, I'd like to discuss two points with you about the Middle East. Yes, Dorothy. If I may. One is about the, your discussion that you had yesterday about Mr. Arafat being recognized by many countries. And the other is about the letter that uh, Ronald Reagan has sent to Menachem Begin. Uh, I'll, I'll, do you have a preference as to which I discuss first? It's up to you. Okay. Uh, let me discuss uh, Arafat's recognition by certain countries. You, your explanation yesterday was fine, except that I felt it was a little simplistic. For example, when Arafat was recognized by, by Japan, it wasn't because they thought he was a great leader. I never said it was. No, but that was one of the points. You know, I never said it was, uh, oh. Dorothy. I wish I wish you'd relax a little bit, Dorothy. Oh, I'm... You know, Dorothy, you call every week like you're sitting there from on high in judgment. Bob, oh, I'm and, so uh, upset. You have no idea. Well, oh. I do have an idea, Dorothy, because you tell me every week that you're upset. Well, every, it's not every week, but believe me. This... All right, every two weeks. All right. Uh, Mr. Gwen, I'm Bacon. Yes. 
be seen from Ronald Reagan. I think the timing of that letter could not be worse. I am not privy to anything that Menachem Begin does, but I'll tell you one thing. Casper Weinberger is there, and I am sure he will get the message. I have never seen a country treat an ally the way the United States is real. It exerts the greatest amount of pressure against Israel. It doesn't pressure the Saudis to stop their embargo against the Israelis. I'm talking about the, their economic embargo. It doesn't tell the Saudis to stop financing and sending arms to the PLO. It only pressures Israel. You once accused me of being paranoid. You said Israelis or Jews are paranoid. I don't think they're paranoid. I think their reaction is an accurate reaction. Can't they... Uh, I don't know of any, uh, any truly paranoid person who goes around saying, uh, I'm, I'm paranoid. Uh, to be paranoid, one says... Uh, I'm paranoid, yes, that's true. But look, I can't help it that those guys are following me. On WMCA, we thank Dorothy and say hello to you. But uh, call again, please. Yes, thank Good you. hearing from you. Thank you so yes, much, Jeff. Right. And that slams the lid on things for today. For those of you <laughs> for those of you that didn't make it in, do hope we, we get a chance to talk tomorrow. Until then, remember, your influence counts. Use it. Get Qaddafi! 57. Turns around, he's saying... We've got to increase benefits. Well, in order to increase benefits, you have to increase the taxes. Uh, people like Claude Pepper, and by the way, with all due respect to Claude Pepper, I think that maybe, well, look, let's face it, Alzheimer's disease strikes everybody. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. When you said that the Westchester contingent uh, doesn't uh, follow you uh, uh, very, very carefully, and you said that you felt that the uh, station was wasting money. I do, I do. I'm going to recommend to uh, Errol Hansen, our comptroller, that they uh, rip out the line. Oh, please. I want to thank you, and I mean that sincerely, for, for, for putting back your, uh, your tagline that I love so much about Get Gaddafi. Well, we had a, a consultant come out here from Southern California who said everybody should end the program by saying the top of the hour to you. So... Uh, you know me. I hey, listen. If I get if I get an order, I I try to follow it. You know, I do my best to be a good guy, company man, and um, that's why I dropped it. Um, that's 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 the truth. Well, thank you. Oh, oh. yes. I'm next. You're on right now. Yeah, sir. right now. I've been away for two years. I came back yesterday, and I want to know how you're doing. I want to know what you're doing. Obviously, I'm doing the same thing. I'm taking both. How do I know what the same thing is from two years? Uh, okay. On the radio, I'm very glad. All right, I'll take. Uh, okay, I'll take out the word obviously, and I'll tell you, uh, I'm doing essentially the same thing. You fighting? 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 Uh, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. Is it claret? Is it what? Uh, Sauvign uh Cabernet Sauvignon? Muscatel? Or just plain old cheap No, gin? my dear. I have been away for two years and I came back yesterday. No, 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 no. What are you doing today? I mean, quaffing a little bit? A little bit of the <clears throat> grape? A little bit. Well, you always do that. Who are you supporting in the election? But I mean, how many have you had prior to making this call? None. None? Who are you supporting? In? You're lucky. You can get this way without, without taking anything. That's great. Take a deep breath. You know how wonderful it is to come back to New York? No. How no, wonderful... Then you should go away, Barbara. <laughs> Great. Where were you these past two years? On the... Uh, in New England, in Alaska. In Alaska. And New England. And New England. Of course, they're side by side. Uh... <laughs> oh, dear. What were you doing? Not, but one does manage it somehow. Yeah. Well, what are you doing? Are you still fighting wealthy mothers? Uh, may I ask um, what you're doing? I am waiting to go on vacation. Wait a minute. You said you just got back after two. Right. <laughs> and now you're going out again. You sound like a lady with a uh, Did what's-his-name croak a few hey, years what? ago and leave you with a... Hey, what? What? Who, whom do you support in the elections that I'm passing through? Who, uh, Grover Whalen. Grover Whalen. Good. I thought perhaps it would be Robert Wagner, Jr. Well, what's he running for? Hello? At least they still let you on the radio. Yes, I'm still on the radio. Well, they still let me live. 
<laughs> yes, they did. Well, listen, dear, I'll tell you something. The next time you throw a cocktail party, please start it a little later, will you? All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome, my old friend. Okay. And uh, I wonder if she's a New York Met fan. I forgot to ask her that. And it occurs to me that nobody cares about the gubernatorial election yet. Nobody's interested yet. But I suppose as we get into later September and into October, WMCA callers will want to talk about it. But right now, there appears to be no interest whatsoever in any issue other than the Middle East, and even that has calmed out. The people, let me say, I'm supposed to be a social commentator, well, let me say, the people are less interested in articulating their views than ever before. What does it mean? It means either A, now get a load of this logic, either A, they're just not interested, they couldn't care less, maybe they're all busy playing with their Ataris, or B, that they feel so unsure of themselves, they are afraid to articulate, or C, <clears throat> nobody's listening. Time when they were all concentrated in West Beirut, that was a time that they probably could have been wiped out. Now that they're all spread out all over, it's going to be terrifically hard to get them. I think that they won. They didn't lose. It was Israel that lost. What do you think? I think, Bernard, you're, you're not making any sense. Why? Well, because, uh, as uh, Ariel Sharon said, they were expelled from Lebanon. That is what Israel wanted to accomplish. Uh, they uh, were no match militarily for the Israeli army. Uh, they were smashed militarily. Uh, they were humbled to such an extent that they could crowd into a, a section of West Beirut. And it was only because uh, uh, Menachem Begin said uh, they didn't want to make a martyr out of that skunk Arafat, that they let him, all, let him uh, get out. Remember, it wasn't a question of wanting to, uh, to uh, kill every one of them. They wanted, uh, they wanted an end to the shelling of places like Maalot and uh, uh, Sh uh, Shmona and places like that. But now... Shmona. They're, they're divided up into different areas. And, uh, well, they can't, they can't do any damage to Israel where they are. They, from Tunis, they can't hurt them. From Damascus, they can't hurt them. Not right uh, now. From Amman, they can't hurt them. Not right now. But... All right, we'll wait, Bernard. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, that's Bernard on WM. And they don't love you about uh, right or wrong, and uh, that's why we're in the pickle that we're in. What do you think of that, Paul? Well, I think you're, you're overstating the case. I don't that think. Way. Well, uh, I, I don't think all movies have been devoid of any morals. I don't think uh, all uh, plays have been devoid of uh, of uh, any moral message. I don't think all people are so cynical that they they share your belief. Uh, I don't believe all people cheat on their income tax. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I, I say the majority I know, of the people in the United States, if they can get away with uh, a false insurance claim. Uh, well, so what you're saying is that people have come to the point where they uh, are trying to get away with something, and uh, to what extent you're right, I'm not prepared to say, and I don't think you are either. I don't think there's anybody that can say it's 70 percent, 60 percent of the population, 51 percent. We won't. We won't. We... By just talking to people. How well, many... then I well. guess then I guess you go around talking to people who like to confess to you. Whatever the case may be, let me say this. Let me say this. All you can do is to be comfortable with yourself. True. And if not violating the law makes you comfortable, then don't violate the law. I'm always suspicious of people, and this means you, pal, who are so righteous and who talk in such a sanctimonious fashion about others. Because that makes me wonder, what is this guy doing? All right. Is this the one perfect guy? Is this the one Ozanda? Is that what he is? Wait a while, huh? I mean, you know, who the heck are you, the conscience of America? Uh, who are you to be yelling at me? I'm yelling at you because I think you're overstating the case. All right, that's fine. But you're saying uh, nobody's calling up uh, to give their opinions. I'm giving you my opinion. You're jumping all over me. I'm jumping all over you. I'm jumping all over you verbally. I, I, I mentioned, wait a while now. Uh, you wait a while. No, no, you wait a while. Hey. 
you, if I mention a name and I said this guy is doing this or that guy is doing that, then you could say, who the hell are you? You're so damn sanctimonious. You I'm are not, sanctimonious. I'm you are sanctimonious. I think you're just jealous of the guys that you think I... I had a call before about the credit card. They, they're using this and they're using that and they're using this and they're getting away with it. That's just exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. The guy's getting away with it. He ain't worried about what is right or wrong. Who's being sanctimonious? You are. You're being sanctimonious. I'm just giving an opinion on why I say that the, the, the uh, country is going down the drain. That's all. That's not being sanctimonious. You know, one of these you days... the same damn thing. You get up there and you say, you'll never realize by the year 2000... <laughs> hey, 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 Pat. You're, you're being sanctimonious. Hey. Well, you're going to say, well, we're going to realize well, by I'm, the year 2000. I'm right? Bob hey. Grant. I'm Bob Grant. I'm a commentator. <laughs> it's my job. Listen, pal. Yeah, right. Hey, wait a minute. You see what you're missing the point is? Someday, we're going to get a system here like I've been... Like I've been begging for, crying for, pleading for, praying for. We're going to get a system here where I can say to the Jadrul in the booth, pal, go back, play the tape of this guy, and I want him to hear something. And we'll both hear something. And you think I'm going to hear myself at the same time? No, 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 no. Hey, hey, hey. Am I missing a point again? Hey, who's on? Just a minute. Now, slow sure. down, slow down, slow down. You're the guy who opened up the conversation by saying these things. And I listened. I listened very carefully because I think you express yourself very forcefully and very clearly, and I appreciate that. But then you said, Bob, what do you think? All right, you asked me what I thought, so I'm telling you what I think. Right. Then you get mad at me because I tell you what I think. <laughs> you told me what you think, and I told you what I thought of what you thought, that's all. Yeah, but I mean, I wasn't going to say anything. You said I'm sanctimonious. I didn't say it. Hey, I wasn't going to say it. Hey, I wasn't gonna if say I go and I say, uh, Bert Knapp is this way, he's sanctimonious just because he was a World War II hero. So, you know? He was no hero. Oh, that's what I heard. Right. Anyway, hey, I'm not saying, I'm not mentioning a name, I'm saying something in general, I'm not attacking anybody, so I'm not being sanctimonious. You know, I like it too much, you made me feel bad. I made you feel bad, you made me feel bad because you talked, you said what you were going to say, and then you asked me what I thought, and because I didn't agree with yeah, you 100%, right. no, 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 you get mad at me. But I don't want you to knock me like that. Well, wait, what are you getting mad at me for? You know what you're going to do all weekend long, I know it. You All weekend long, you're going to go around bad, bad rapping me, I know it. No, I, I can tell. I just feel bad. Uh, well, I tell you what, if you if you feel bad, yes. then I think uh, you're making a terrible mistake. Then you're being dumb. Before you were being no, sanctimonious. No, 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 now you get... The, what no, the... I'm being sanctimonious. Huh? I don't know, Bob. You used to be one of my heroes, but I don't know now. Now you're mad at me. No, nah, not really. Hey. I'm just joking with you. You're joking with me. What? I hope it's good radio, that's all. <laughs> good, <laughs> what a good radio. <laughs> Hey, you're all right, pal. Okay. Okay, hey, have a good week. I'll call you again. Thank you. It's my first time. All right, uh -huh. you, did, you did good, you did uh -huh. good. I wonder where Paul of Pleasantville is. I tell you, you know, you know what's bothering me terrifically? Paul of Pleasantville called, and he told me off for 11 minutes. I mean, he really told me off, but good. He did, he did a great job of telling me off. And then he said, Bob, this weekend I'm going to get together with 250 guys at a barbecue, and we're going to spend the weekend talking about you. And what a kafoon. He pronounced it kafoon. I say kafoon. He said, we're going, to we're going to discuss what a kafoon you turned out to be. Now, you know, I don't know something. That's two, three weeks ago, and I haven't heard from Paul of Pleasantville. But wherever I go, people say, hey, you know, that guy was interesting. You ought to have him on again. How could I have him on again? He doesn't call. He disappeared. I don't understand those people. I mean, the Gumbara from Yonkers, he disappeared. But at least before he did, he called every week for years and years. So the uh, Gumbara earned his, his uh, sabbatical, his lifetime sabbatical. By the way, for those of you who write in, no, uh, uh, no. Uh, He's uh, no father mort. Uh, he's he's not dead. He's well, Gumbar is alive and well in Yonkers. Yes, we've had uh, some people coming in giving blood all week long, and uh, the, mo the the craziest of them inevitably all come over to me and say, "You Bob Grant? Oh gee, you don't look at all like I thought you'd look." Every single one of them. What a bunch of well. Uh, I was going to say cabons, but that wouldn't be nice to say that about people who give blood. But why is it that they always have to say, 
I'll tell you why they say that. Because people make a, a it's an involuntary, it's an automatic, it's a reflex. You hear a person's voice and you conjure up what they look like. That's why I hate radio. Because people can't see the guy. Then when they do see him, they're amazed that he's so young and handsome. Who on WMCA? Oh, Bob, this is Charlie from Yonkers, or otherwise known as the Gumbada from Yonkers. I don't believe it. The Gumbada's making a comeback. I'm not making a comeback. I heard you make a comment before that people have been writing letters to you that I've been dead, that I don't call you. You also made a comment that you don't hear from WMC, uh, from Westchester County anymore, and that you're going to cut the line out. So I said, well, I better get on the ball and call you. But this I want you to know. I've been listening to you every week. Every day for the last 12 years. I haven't forgotten you. I don't listen to any other radio but WNCA. I guess you know that. I was even listening to you last week when you was down there. You were know coming. Uh, Woodbine? Was that Woodbine? Uh, that was in, uh, outside of Hackettstown, New Jersey, Charlie. Well, anyway, I was listening to you. Understand? Uh-huh. I was just wishing that I was there with you. Oh, I wish you were too, Charlie. All right. I had to make this call to you, Bob, but I want the people out there to write letters to you, write letters to me, ask me why I don't call you. Well, the reason I don't call you, number one, is I've been in business. I just got out of it. I'm out of business again. I retired again. Okay? Uh-huh. And uh, I, what else can I say? Well, listen, you see, it's. Uh, i tell you why the people react that way. You established yourself as uh, what I would call a, a key man, a key caller. And you were one of those rare people who, when you called, uh, people listened. And uh, no matter what you were talking about, it was like a little program within a program, Charlie. Right. And uh, uh, they developed, you know, after all, you, you never violated the seven-day rule, but you were regular, you called every week. And people, you know how uh, individuals will uh, form habits, and they got used to hearing you. Uh, so... I know it's not fair for a lot of people, as soon as you don't call for a while, to say, what happened to him? What, gee, is he dead? Is he this? Is he that? It's not fair for you, but on the other hand, you can't blame them, Charlie. I understand that, Bob. But, uh, I, look, I, I, all I want to say is that I paid my dues, you know what I mean? You sure did. You've been nice to me for the 12 years that I know you. And, uh... But as long as you're on the line, let me say this. You know, not too, too far away from the holiday season and so forth, and... It's getting uh, close to a time that uh, we'll have to uh, take that walk. You know where. As the people have been asking me about you, they say, uh, when is Bob coming back to the Bronx? When is he coming up to 187 Street out the rabbit? We want to see him. We missed him last time. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll get Bob, even if I have to get him after line somewhere, but I won't get him back to the Bronx, and I won't disappoint you people. You know, I said to you last year that when I got a real good entrant, I was going to uh, organize a Shvillyadel eating contest. Okay. Now I, I didn't have a, a real good uh, a real good contender, but I got a guy now, producer by the name of Mike Thompson. Now, I don't know how long he's going to last because they don't last long around here, you know. Right. But if he lasts uh, close to the season, I want to enter him into the uh, Shvillyadel cannoli eating contest up there. You know, Bob. When you, when you mention, Maybe we'll t we'll have him pitted against Arthur Parker. Oh, wait. Right. You mentioned Sweet Ale. I think about the time you had the six Sweet Ale with six cups of black coffee at one party. I'll never forget that. Yeah, I'm a Gannaruda. Charlie, you know, I'm a Gannaruda. Real Gavon, but we won't tell anybody. Right. <laughs> Listen, give my regards to Nettie. Uh, Nettie's here, right here. She says, say hello to Bob for me. Tell him he's uh, welcome to come up here anytime he wants to. Uh, one of the big Italian players that we have every year, you know. All right, stuff shells, Charlie. Stuff shells. Stuff shells, okay. 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 Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. No fear, I'm still alive. Okay, that's a goombata from Yonkers. That is... Bert, that kills the, uh, the the rumors that were circulating about a goombata from Yonkers that uh, Maselli had him taken care of. Uh, he's uh, still with us. See, people missed him. Uh, they, yeah, I, could, uh, I could go away for a year, they wouldn't notice it. A goombata, they notice. Uh, until else. Monday, Labor Day, Bob Grant reminding you, your influence counts. Use it. Get now, Kanafi. 57. And this guy Brown and his pal are charged with the murder of Mr. Briggs. Uh, guess what? Guess what? 
one of these two guys charged with this murder, one of these two guys charged with this murder, uh, was uh, allegedly convicted of another murder. You see what I mean? I don't understand that. <laughs> I don't understand that. Hey, I was traumatized by the same movies you were, remember? They take Jimmy Cagney screaming and crying and saying he really was a really was a good guy, or his mother would say he's a good guy. Jane Darwell would say he's a good guy. Pat O'Brien would say he's a good guy. Somebody would pray. And we all, the movies conditioned us to be sympathetic for the murderer. Whether it was George Rav, Jimmy Cagney, didn't make any difference. We were, we were manipulated by the motion picture industry to have our sympathies go, even in the case of Barry and Clyde. I tell you, I hated to see him get rubbed out the way they did. I really did. And that little fink, that little, that little pudgy fink that turned him in, I hated him. And that goat roper that said, well, don't you worry, don't you worry, son, don't you worry. I hated him. I didn't want to see Bonnie and Clyde get all shot up like that. I wanted to see, well, why? Because I was manipulated, right? Anyway, we've been so manipulated, we forget. Killers kill. And if you let them out, they'll kill again. And again. And again. Have we not learned? No, we haven't. Will we ever learn? No, we won't. And unfortunately, James Bronson is only an actor. And what he did was only a movie. A different kind of movie. What? The pronunciation probably should be Saint uh, uh, World Vitus, uh, named after a Vitus or whatever. But actually, the young man is a Lithuanian, and the first name that he's carrying is only a contraction of the word Vitotus. So then it's Vitus. So it's Vitus, Gerolitis, not Vitus, because, uh, in fact, I understand that uh, uh, Barry uh, Farber also is very familiar with... Uh, pronunciation of, uh, of those Lithuanian names. But that's the oh, God that. bless Barry, he's the only guy outside of myself who remembers that Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia were invaded and overrun by Joe Stalin and his murdering uh, swine in 1940. But that at one time, they were free independent nations. But now they're just considered republics of the Soviet Socialist uh, Union of Republics. You are taking it very badly to heart. But in their heart of hearts, Lithuanians will always be Lithuanians and never uh, Soviets. Thank you for today. For those of you who didn't make it in, do hope we get a chance to talk tomorrow. Until then, your influence counts. Use it. Get Gaddafi. No. Uh, Zafarano. Z-A-F-A-R-A-N-O. Or Z-O-F-A-R-A-N-O. Of Richmond Hill, Queens. Hey, Mr. Grant, this letter is in response to your requests about opinions on a trip to the eastern countries for you. Yes, I think it's a good idea. And stay there a long time. Your insensitive, ungallant remarks about Roseanne Salmonella were very rude, especially since your voice leaves a lot to be desired and your looks also. Since getting that award, your ego has been bigger than ever. I'm surprised you're not thinking of running for office. Get off the air, you creep. Signed, Anna Zafferano of Richmond Hill, Queens. And this is Bob Grant reminding you, your influence counts. Get Gaddafi! One of whom was replaced by Tom Weird. Um... Uh, they don't even have to be attractive, but they do have to be female. And uh, they have to know how to read a teleprompter. That's all they do. Let me tell you, that's all they do. They read a teleprompter. And they have perfected the teleprompters to such a great extent that the teleprompter words are flashed right across the camera itself. So that all of the Gabons out there say, Oh, she's so smart. Look, she looks right at that camera. And she's not, she doesn't even have to read that. She knows all that. Well, she's reading all that. Uh, broadcast journalism, it would seem to me, would be much more honest 
If we would use the same terminology they use in the United Kingdom and in Australia, and in Canada, and in a few other places, they don't say, now here's your correspondent, Ethel Shagnasty. They say, and now here to read the news is Ethel Shagnasty. But anyway, that's another matter. A son so at the uh, university in Florence. And then, of course, uh, many, many have uh, the youngsters at the University of Guadalajara in Mexico. That is known as the Fifth Pathway. And uh, I salute those people. I admire their, their courage. You know, they talk about bilingualism. They talk about people who come to this country and can't learn the language. All of the people who participate in that Guadalajara program, for example, these are American, American youngsters. They not only are going to learn medicine, but they're going to learn medicine in a foreign language. And I've known many of them who had to learn Spanish first. They learn it well enough to become doctors. I want to ask you, why is it that people who come here from other lands, lands where the native tongue is Spanish can't learn to speak English, at least enough to get by, let alone to become doctors. Would someone ask, is, don't tell me, don't tell me that they are genetically, inherently incapable. I refuse to believe that. No group is inferior to any other. The fault lies not with those individuals. The fault lies with the bleeding hearts who have torn asunder the fabric of this once great republic. Had to be entertained with sport, and they became so involved with sport that the Roman Empire, once the mightiest entity the world had ever known. And I, I, oftentimes I wonder whether Caligula or someone like that was an ancestor of mine, because that's that's where my folk come from, you know. Anyway. Oh, you're such a brute. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Why did that guy have to be speaking with an echo? I don't know. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes. Anyway, the fact of the matter is, that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. On any Sunday now, from now until... At least Super Sunday, which is January 30th now. They keep moving it back, moving it back. I could see it all now. Guy says, I'm sorry, I can't go to high mass at Easter because I won't get out in time for all the pregame programs for Super Sunday. And can you imagine if as much attention were paid to Easter Sunday as it is to Super Sunday? What a, oh my, I don't even want to think about this. Anyway, let's get back. Can you, every Sunday now, There'd be about 40, 50 million beer-bellied, beer-bellied slobs watching uh, 750 guys in reasonably good shape run around. By the way, I hurt, uh, I hurt my, my finger ripping out the Westchester County line, but it, it felt good. It felt good. I ripped it out. Is that all? Don't try calling. Anybody there at 237-WMCA, don't try to use it. Remind me to put it back in when I get off the air because the next guy might want it. He'll grip. Night football. Let me tell you for Monday Night Football. Uh, what, what usually happens as the season progresses, as you get toward the end of the season, according to a survey made the last two years now, what happens is more and more people are not listening to the sound of uh, the channel airing the game, but have the sound down and listen to Hank Stram, who comes in over the radio. Because Hank Stram and uh, Jack Buck do a true professional, uh, professional job. And if you don't have the audio up, you don't have to hear the incessant uh, front-running of the chameleon who says, have you noticed, if you're watching, let's say uh, you're watching Dallas versus the Steelers, and let's say the Steelers are dominating in the first half, you'll hear this. And I tell you, Gifford, your Terry Bradshaw just cannot be denied. I said it over and over again, and Lynn Swan is the greatest. Okay, then they go in the locker room for the half. And uh, 
the Cowboys dominate the second half. And then you'll hear, yes, Gifford, as I was saying, there's nothing like a Landry-coached team. I mean, it's it's just incredible how this man has, uh, has uh, retained his position. I have not yet met anybody, anybody who likes his yeah, that contribution. I liked him, though. You know why? I got to get one of these... Uh, you know what, Mike, call, uh, call uh, Lieutenant General uh, Vandershaft because uh, he's the adjutant of the United States Marines. He's in charge of those uh, bumper stickers. Remember when I tried to make a thing out of uh, reading oddball bumper stickers on WMCA? And it really went over like a lead balloon. But... Uh, Lieutenant General Vandershaft, Lieutenant General Vandershaft of the Marines, is the man who was responsible for the bumper sticker that says, the few, the proud, the Marines. I can see it all now. The few, the very few, the proud, the very proud. We'll call Bob Grant. <laughs> I had intended today to share with you a very telling, very sickening, really, account of a welfare mother, a brood sow, a person who adds to the weight of our society, a person who continues to be a burden, but uh, other matters interpose, so we will turn our attention to that at another time. Curious situation in the world where a person, a foreigner, a citizen of another country can come into our country and buy up a bunch of newspapers and suddenly become an opinion maker, a shaper, a shaker, and yes, even a kingmaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take on Rupert Murdoch. That's me, Bob Grant. Not any radio station, not any broadcasting company. Me, Bob Grant, little Bob Grant. And believe you me, what do I have? The resources that uh, Mr. Murdoch has? Well, it, 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 it's, it's a joke to even think about such a thing. But this man has come on the scene not too long ago, back in the uh, middle uh, 70s, Actually, uh, the first uh, campaign he was involved in was the 1977 mayoral campaign when he put Eddie Koch in the mayor's chair. Now, it's one thing to uh, practice uh, editorial judgment. It's one thing to take uh, editorial stands, and I think that's fine. I'm, I think Mr. Murdoch has just as much a right as anybody to uh, have his editorials uh, but of course, as you well know, his newspaper goes even beyond that. Not just editorializing, it's um, shaping the news to uh, make his candidate look good. I, I think you've seen him do it in gubernatorial campaigns, mayoral campaigns, yes, presidential campaigns. And I say this even though most of the candidates he backs up, candidates that I'm sympathetic to myself. The only difference between him and me in this context is I can't really endorse a candidate. Not a flat-out official endorsement. But time and time again, I see the New York Post dredging up headlines and stories that are either A, misleading, B, exaggerated, or C, in the worst possible taste. I think we have a, an example of C on the front page of the New York Post today. I never knew anybody that didn't admire and have uh, genuine respect for and affection for Grace Kelly. I think that anybody who isn't moved by her untimely and tragic and macabre death uh, is not really a feeling person. But I just wonder about this headline, The World Wants to Know. 
That's what it says. The world wants to know. Above that, it says Princess Grace cover-up. Now, I, I don't intend to conduct a class in journalism here, but what do they mean by Princess Grace cover-up? In nowhere in the post do I see, either on the front page or in the stories inside the paper, any indication that they know something we don't know. Nowhere do they come flat out and say, we know what really happened and here's what really happened. Instead, they say there's a cover-up and then they pose questions. Was Stephanie driving illegally? Could Grace have been saved? Why are they hiding the death car? And then, of course, conveniently, at the bottom, in red, starts today the Grace Kelly you never knew. Why do they wait till now to run that? Well, that's another story. 